morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar about making tax digital. I'm Wendy Andrews, VAT Director at Bishop Fleming, and I'm joined this morning by Carl Everard and Guy from Tax Systems, um, who are going to share some of their, their software. Um, okay, next slide. The purpose of the morning is really to have a chat about the second phase of ma making tax digital, which started on the 1st of April 2021. Um, talk about what your options are in addressing the issues that come up as a result of it, some actions, and then a um, demonstration of some software which might be able to help you um, with your issues. Next slide, please. So first of all, what is Making Tax Digital for VAT Phase 2? Um, I thought it might be useful if I just quickly recapped on what Phase 1 actually was. Um, I'm sure you'll remember that for, from the 1st of April 2019, there is a requirement for all VAT registered businesses over the turnover threshold to file their VAT returns on a new digital platform, either by filing directly from their accounting software or by using some bridging software. Um, and I'm sure you've all, despite probably some issues, managed to, to come to terms with that. And for two years now, you'll have been submitting your VAT returns using Making Tax Digital. Um, the second phase of the of the project was due to come in on either the 1st of April or the 1st of October of 2020, um, but like so many things was delayed by COVID um, and now started on the 1st of April 2021. Um, and that requirement of making tax digital for VAT is, is a requirement to have full digital links throughout your VAT reporting and accounting process. Um, so really, the whole trail going back from your VAT return to the primary documents like purchase invoices and sales invoices, all the links um, within that need to be digital. Um, apologies, I'll just take a break there because I forgot to mention a couple of other things. One is the fact that this, um, this uh, webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to see a recording afterwards. And the second one was to say, if you do have any questions as we go through, um, please put them into the Q&A pane in Zoom. Um, if you want to use the chat uh, for chatting with other participants, that's fine, but we won't be monitoring that. So if you have a question, please could you put it into the Q&A? Sorry about that, meant to say it at the beginning. Um, right, so back to digital links. Um, and this requirement for digital links is obviously far more complicated uh, for businesses to come to terms with. In terms of the digital filing of VAT returns, there was really one thing to sort out, how do I file my VAT return? In terms of digital links, it's a much more complicated process, particularly for large or complex organisations, where you really need to look in a lot of detail at the, the chain of reporting VAT transactions to make sure you have got digital links um, throughout the process. Um, HMRC have published some guidance on what they consider to be a digital link. And to be honest, their definition of a digital link um, is quite broad. Sorry, could I go back to the previous slide? Sorry, thank you. Um, HMRC's definition of digital links is fairly broad. Um, and basically, they mainly say what a digital link isn't rather than what it is. So the things that you particularly can't have in your VAT um, reporting journey, as they call it, um, is you mustn't be cutting and copying or pasting and pasting information into your VAT return spreadsheet or whatever. Um, so if you're doing that, that's a break in the digital trail. Um, and you mustn't be making any manual entries. It's no good taking some numbers, a total from one system and then typing them into a spreadsheet or a different system. That obviously isn't also a digital link. Um, and the other thing to look out for if you have spreadsheets um, in use throughout your, your digital journey is that there aren't any broken formulas, that all the data is flowing through the spreadsheets um, sort of properly without any, any hiccups. Sorry, next slide, please, then. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so, yes, and so just to talk about really what, what actually is a digital link. Um, and that's an electronic transfer of information between programs or applications. Um, HMRC and really the whole point of making tax digital is that um, by reducing manual interventions or processes like copy and paste, um, the view is that this will make VAT returns more accurate um, and less, less susceptible to errors that you might have if you are typing information in. 
So just some examples of what HMRC see as, as a digital link, um, link cells within spreadsheets, CSV downloads, imports and exports between systems, um, downloading and uploading files between systems, API, automated transfer of data, um, use of a portable device. Um, I know particularly um, with some accounting systems, you can use um, your phone, et cetera, to, to photograph invoices and put them into your accounting system. Um, and then lastly, and slightly strangely, I have to say, HMRC do also mention that they consider that a digital link within the VAT reporting process isn't broken if you have a spreadsheet with your VAT return information on it and you email it to your tax agent so that that agent can prepare your VAT return. I have to say, I think that might be taking the definition of digital links um, quite far, but um, obviously very helpful to businesses. So you've got all these things which are digital links and you've got the things which aren't digital links. And it's a matter now really for businesses from the 1st of April to look in quite a lot of detail at all the input into their VAT return process and make sure that it is coming in digitally and being transferred digitally where that's a requirement. And as I say, that's, that's quite complicated um, and it's different certainly from the clients I've been talking to each client has a slightly different issue because it's a matter of where you've got bespoke systems, where you've perhaps got a separate stock system or booking system. How is all that data getting into your VAT return? Um, is that being done digitally? And I think I'm handing over to, to Guy Hipsley-Cox from um, Tax Systems now who's going to talk about some specific examples. Thanks, Guy. Brilliant. Thank you, Wendy. So if we go to the next slide. Great. So yeah, so we come across quite a lot of issues with uh, specifically Excel files uh, being used to sort of digitally link a process because typically, obviously, that returns have been very transactional and very manual for a number of years now. And people are quite accustomed to steps like you can see on the screen now. So going, pulling out your sort of reports, pulling out your data for the return, finding out that there's some errors that need correcting, finding out that there's something, maybe you've got a misallocated tax code that needs to be updated in order to properly calculate further down your sort of process chain. Uh, and now obviously with digital linking in place, you won't be able to go in, overwrite that code, bring it into sort of um, in line with the rest of them and even providing notes like you can see on the screen to explain what's been done, who's done it when, um, that's not good enough for HMRC. They need um, a stronger sort of audit trail um, that is tracking in more detail. And as, as Wendy said, it's, we're not going through that manual intervention of overwriting data within Excel or copying and pasting. Um, and there's a few examples that we see like this, but yeah, typically making these sort of corrections is one of those things that we need to work out a way of doing that in a phase two compliant way. But um, not only do we have these sort of steps which are potentially breaking that digital link, um, but just because we have a process that is digitally linked doesn't always mean that it's accurate. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, please. So this is one example that we came across in some client data a few months ago where um, someone had essentially posted in a negative symbol into an equation to account for a small uh, change that was required to properly calculate a quarterly return. Uh, and the important thing is here that this happens quite a lot, making small adjustments to Excel formulas and trying to make sure that um, you're calculating the return correctly for that period. But obviously that Excel sheet is then often reused for the next period and the information about what's been changed or tweaked in order to get to that final figure isn't always shared. So making small changes like this can have a real knock-on effect that means that whilst a process can be digitally linked, it's not necessarily calculating the correct return and you're not necessarily getting to the figures that you want to be. Um, so it's just really worth bearing in mind that not only um, do we have to think about how we're going to digitally link our process, but also even if you do think your process is digitally linked, it's definitely worth reviewing to make sure that it's actually calculating the correct figures. Thank you. So I think uh, handing back to Wendy now. Thank you, Guy. Um, no, first of all, just to introduce myself. So, so my name is Carl, um, as Wendy mentioned. I've been with the business around 19 years now. Um, more recently, over the last two years, it's been supporting clients through these MTD changes from phase one initially, and now looking at the requirements around phase two. So both Wendy and Guy touched on in terms of what MTD is, in terms of phase two, what digital links are, and some really useful examples. What I really want to briefly focus on now are what, what options do you have? 
I think the easiest way to look at it, if we look across our current customers and across the market, you can generally fit yourself into one of these three buckets or options. I think this, this will apply to everyone on the call today. Some of you may have relatively simple VAT returns, whereby you may have a lot of your records within Excel. And the, the risk of using Excel still is, is there, but may not be deemed as a high risk for your business. If you fit in that category, you may well wish to stick with Excel and a simple bridging solution to bridge that data to HMRC. If you're simple and not making adjustments, that will keep you compliant through phase one and also phase two. So in that respect, if you fall into that bucket, there may be no change required for you. Option two is almost the next stage up where you may be using cloud systems. You may be using the likes of Zero, QuickBooks, Sage as an example. However, your business is fairly low, you've got fairly low complexity within your back return business. So what you will tend to find is you may be using your cloud accounting system. However, that cloud accounting system has an NTD module. So you're able to produce and submit your VAT return via that system. If that is the case, my recommendation would be to stick with that particular system. It's minimal disruption. You don't need to change your, your process. And again, you're staying compliant throughout phase two because you're not making any manual adjustments to that data. However, what we're finding is a lot of businesses are falling within option three or bucket three. And for one reason or another, they're using Excel within their process. And that's often two key reasons. You've got data challenges, so you've got data from different sources, or you've got some sort of complexity within your VAT return. You may be partially exempt, you may have reverse charges, and where you're making adjustments within Excel, you're often finding you need to change your process for phase two. So we're finding a lot of businesses that fall within this category are looking to change their process, looking to the market for technology solutions to provide them a way to start automating some of the manual work they're doing and make their lives easier whilst staying compliant. So next question that I, that I tend to get asked, do I need to do anything? Well, when I talk about the three buckets, the clients that fit within that third bucket often ask, well, what should I be looking for? Does this actually apply to me? I then split into four categories, really, where you may have VAT complexity within your return. So do you have VAT groups? Are you partially exempt? Are you making manual adjustments? If you are, you're, you're typically doing things manually in the process and you may well need to change for phase two. Data complexity, a similar thing. Have you got poor quality data? Are you finding you're making a lot of corrections on a regular basis? Do you have data from different sources? Is it other wider business asking for insights over this data and you're struggling to provide the answers because the data just simply isn't there? Again, if any of these are challenges for you, there's technology available in the market now, which can do a lot of this work for you. And then the other two options to look at your yourselves really within your, your business, within your process. Are you finding the, the process challenging? Are you spending a lot of time preparing the return, reviewing the return? Have you struggled with key person dependencies where maybe you've inherited a spreadsheet from somebody and you're not quite sure how it works? Is the business asking more from you? Are you having resourcing issues from the team? Are you finding you're not able to dedicate the time you would like to on the VAT return because of other priorities within the business? An MTD for VAT is the first tax to go digital. Corporate tax will soon follow and HMRC are really pushing the agenda to, to utilise technology. So it's always very important. Don't look just at the nap here and now look at your future needs of your business. If you streamline and automate your process, is that going to help you? Longer term of the business wanting to ask you for tax insights, can you provide more value back to the business? I would always recommend looking forward at least three years to see what HMRC initiatives are coming in, 
see your drives and goals for the business to make sure any investment you're making in technology is future proof for the changes further down the line. I'll just pass back over to Wendy, because again, the next question we, we tend to get asked, what we have had before, is are there any options to defer phase two in terms of in relation to your, your first submission? So Wendy, over to you. Thanks, thanks very much, Carl. Um, yes, because obviously, um, obviously the introduction of phase two was delayed as a result of, of COVID, which has obviously disrupted a lot of businesses hugely. Um, as many of you all know, Brexit has also, um, for anyone especially trading internationally with the EU um, in goods, has led to huge disruptions and, and issues which have needed to be resolved. Um, and HMRC, in their, in their public notice on making tax digital for VAT, do envisage that some businesses might want to defer the obligation to have digital links throughout their process. Um, but I think it's fair to say that businesses who are going to be able to defer will be quite narrowly defined and you do have to actually engage with HMRC and get their agreement to a deferral. Um, it's unlikely that they will agree to a deferral just because it's difficult to implement um, the requirements of making tax digital. Um, exceptional circumstances. Um, it says unlikely. Um, I think I think generally speaking, it would be fair to say that HMRC are relatively sympathetic to businesses, especially those that have been badly hit by COVID. Um, so it may be appropriate to engage with HMRC if there are some exceptional circumstances um, in your business, which will make it difficult for you to comply. But the critical thing is that you engage with HMRC um, as soon as possible, because obviously we've passed the 1st of April. So the requirement is in now. Um, so you would need to engage with them as soon as possible, but definitely worth considering if you do have those um, exceptional circumstances, but certainly wouldn't want to make any guarantees about the likelihood of HMRC um, agreeing to a delay in um, implementation in those circumstances. Um, and then the two situations which HMRC do kind of specifically refer to um, in their guidance when they might agree to a deferral are where there are, is a major IT project going on which is directly related to the um, VAT accounting process um, for example the new implementation of a new ERP system etc um, and also where there's been an acquisition of another business which is needing to be integrated and obviously lots of systems issues around doing that um, so certainly if you are in either of those situations um, it will be worth perhaps engaging with HMRC I'd say they will probably expect um, a timetable they won't probably give an open-ended deferral. They'll expect to know um, when you're going to be able to comply if, if you do want a deferral. Um, and obviously the other things just to stress is something that's gonna have to happen at some point. You're gonna have to sort out digital links. So in some cases it might be easier to devote resources to getting the issues sorted out rather than having a lengthy um, debate with HMRC about whether you can have a deferral or not. So a tricky one. Um, and again, very much down to the individual situation in, in an individual business at, at the moment. Okay, sorry, back to, back to Carl, I think. Yes, thank you, Wendy. So I mentioned a moment ago in terms of where businesses are investing in technology or, or going through a change, it's important not just to look at the here and now, but to look at the future of MTD. Um, we're generally finding HMRC are introducing more and more regulatory requirements, whether that's MTD, we've got SAO, we've got a, a number of requirements introduced from HMRC that are affecting businesses. And I think what, the one that's most relevant to everybody on the call today is looking at MTD for corporate tax. So going through a consultation at the moment, HMRC are going through a consultation at the moment. So these changes won't be imminent. You're looking at, I believe, 2026, um, where these changes could come in. But just to have a look at some of the proposals and something that would be likely introduced by HMRC with regards to the timelines around corporate tax. So if we look at your corporate tax return at, at present, if we look at, say, a, a, December, a December year end, your statutory accounts will be filed nine months after the year end in September, and your CT return will have to be submitted 12 months after the, the year end. So at present, any profits made within the business on a quarterly basis 
are reported in some cases 18 months later or 21 months later in terms of your CT return when you actually submit that data to HMRC. So what HMRC are proposing is to bring the filing requirements forward. So throughout the financial year, you'll be submitting quarterly returns, much like you do in the VAT space. So your first quarter will be submitted from January to March, will be submitted in April. Your second quarter will be submitted in July. And this data you're submitting would typically be submitted 12 months after the original year end. So from moving from a, you're reporting your profits up to 21 months later, moving forward, you may well need to uh, submit your profits and your reports one month after you've actually made those profits. So it's a significant change in terms of timings. And I think it's something you need to consider when you're looking at processes, because it's going to have a, an impact on resources 100%. And the final change they're proposing is your final CT return, rather than allowing you 12 months after the year end, to then align this with your statutory accounts submission. So in theory, you could have five submissions, your Q1, your Q2, your Q3, your Q4, and then a final year end submission where you're doing the, the true up between your quarterly submissions and your year end results. So quite a significant change, something to bear in mind, not necessarily for now, but where you're looking at process changes, a lot of the, the focus comes in the data. And what Wendy mentioned it earlier, the data is really important. So just consider this when, you, when you're going through your reviews. And before I pass over to Guy, just to touch on some survey insights. So we here at Tax Systems, we provide compliance solutions. So we've been around for 30 years, predominantly in the corporate tax space, but, but VAT for the last two or three years. And we do a lot of questionnaires. We speak with a lot of our clients, prospects. Um, you, you may well have seen some of our questionnaires and research on accountancy age and, and taxation, but I just wanted to share some of this with you today. Four key things really that have come out of a lot, a lot of the data we've, we've seen. When we're speaking to VAT teams about their process, the, the thing that comes out the most is teams are spending far too long collecting data, collecting and managing data. So 75% of the clients we've spoken to, they, well, they spend 75% of their time collecting data and managing that data. Again, time that's best, their best spent elsewhere. Businesses always want to save time. 80%, 87% of businesses want to reduce compliance workloads. With HMRC initiatives, we're finding compliance workloads are being increased year on year. So where you're doing things manually, you really should be looking at how you can automate those to try and reduce the compliance burden on your team. What was really interesting, we, we asked this at our, our last conference around data, data accuracy. And we're finding over the years, businesses are starting to lose confidence within their VAT return process. As in, they, they know there are errors within the return, but it's very hard to spot. So businesses are starting to introduce more and more checks to give them more confidence that the returns are correct. And 58% of those, if they can, want to automate error checks. So it's something here at Tax Systems we've been focusing on quite significantly recently, how we can automate these data checks for you to give you confidence that your, your return is accurate and correct. And finally, I saw a lot of this with, with just after phase one, actually, when businesses started to plan for phase two, a lot of organisations went back to their ERP provider or accounting provider to, to help them with phase two. And in some cases, if you're sitting in one of those bucket one or two that I touched on earlier, that does work. However, what we found is where you've got complexities, that process simply doesn't work. And now from the businesses we speak with, 82% of them expect to use specialised software for their tax compliance. And this relates to not only VAT, but also other taxes such as corporate tax as well. So hopefully that's provided you uh, an overview in terms of what making tax digital is, things to be aware of in your process when you're looking at potentially Excel, 
what you need to do. So what bucket do you fall in? What should you be looking for when you're reviewing your process? And again, just a bit of a, a preview in terms of what we're seeing in the market. So now I'll pass over to Guy, who will be able to run through a demonstration of the software to begin. Great stuff, thanks Carl there. Um, so yeah, so what I'm going to be doing is just taking us through a quick example of um, Alphavat, how essentially we go about um, getting our, our sort of soft, uh, getting data into um, Alphavat and then um, essentially generating the VAT return. Um, so Carl, if you could just uh, stop sharing there and that'll give me access. Um, we can have a look at the software itself. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, so what we have here is um, our Alphabat landing page. Um, essentially what we're trying to do with Alphabat is take client processes that are primarily Excel based, um, use the reports that you're probably already producing out of your accounting software, your ERP systems, uh, rather than dropping those into an Excel workbook when you can then calculate your return, um, do your adjustments, uh, do your error checking, data checks, anything like that. Um, we're going to upload them to the platform and from the platform we can then automate the preparation of the return, automate those data checks for you, uh, and move away from kind of spending time preparing your um, actual sort of that return and actually focus more on validating it and driving for, towards efficiency and accuracy. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just take us through a very short example of how we go from uploading data to the final submission piece, uh, and just so you can see how that works. Um, so here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select on the entity that I wanna start preparing the return for. Straight away, you'll see it will come through to this first page where I've currently got no data, no figures in my nine boxes, and that's because I've got to start uploading my data. Um, so typically we see things like a purchase ledger and a sales ledger, any of the reports that you'd expect to be pulling from that VAT account and um, from your ERP system uploaded at this stage. Um, we have some clients where there's just a single file, others where there's dozens, it really doesn't matter. We just wanna make sure that all the data that we need to calculate your VAT return is uploaded at this stage so that it can all be digitally linked and we don't have to worry about um, sort of any manual intervention. Um, one of the things we can also do at this stage is start thinking about um, some data cleansing. So if you need to either manually or automatically block or exclude any transactions, maybe you've got things like intergroup trades or um, you've got some business entertaining that you wanna block, that can all be done automatically. Um, and alternatively, if maybe you've got some um, transactions that need that editing or that correction step that we mentioned earlier, um, we want to make sure that you still have the ability to do that, but obviously you're doing it in a digitally linked environment. So to make those sort of changes, we can come through here, open up our edit screen, and here you can see I can change the tax code of this transaction and provide a reason. And then from there, I'll save this change. It'll update the row so that we're using the most accurate figure for the rest of the return. And obviously we're maintaining that digital audit trail so you can see exactly what the original transaction was, what the updated transaction is, and then the information around the timestamp, user stamp, and all that uh, description information there as well. Now, once we've done that, we've gone through those cleansing steps, we've uploaded our data. It takes us through to the next step, which is the mapping. As I said, all of this mapping is um, automated. Our essentially implementation team prepare this mapping steps. They will do sort of recalculations of prior returns, work with you along the entire journey to make sure it's got complete sign off and you're happy with the way that it's actually generating those final figures. Uh, and it's also at this point where we'll take into account any FX that's required to be applied. But, so taking us through these two mapping steps, uh, essentially, firstly, we're looking at column headers to make sure those are all aligned. And then secondly, we're applying rules and formulas to the upload data to make sure it's feeding through into the right boxes. And it's at this stage that we can actually automate things like partial exemptions, um, postponed VAT accounting, your reverse charge, anything like that that can often be a sort of a, a long part of the process and require a lot of additional work. But once we're happy with that, we can move through to um, our first sort of nine box summary. You can see here um, the VAT returns being calculated and whilst it's being calculated, we're also running our custom data checks. Um, so within the software, as sort of Carl mentioned earlier, we're seeing a lot of drive towards um, sort of an automation of data checking and transaction review. Uh, and that typically sort of manifests itself as our data checks within Alphabet. Um, so you can see now I've got my sort of first nine box summary, give me a good indication of where I currently am with my return. And then down the left hand side here, I've got some separate reports, which we're going to sort of have a look at. 
The first one is the transaction reports that contains my data checks. Uh, the next one is our adjustments report, which allows us to upload manual adjustments. Then we've got the reconciliation, reconciliation report, which allows us to reconcile any data changes that occur within Alpha Pack back to our ERP system. And then finally, in the middle here, we've got um, our actual reporting at the nine box level. So within our data checks, you can see here, we've got a range of um, different sort of uh, checks that are being performed against the data. Um, we've got a selection of standard checks that we do in, within every sort of return. Uh, and these are looking at transactions outside of the return period to uh, make sure that we sort of have an understanding of any maybe timing differences that are contained here that need to be approved, but also to make sure that all the data uploaded is for the correct period. Uh, next, we've got our duplicate transaction checker, which is just reviewing for any duplicate transactions which need to be addressed and maybe stripped out. You can see here, if I open that up, it'll show me those duplicate transactions. So then mark them out. I can mark one as duplicate, the other as not. And then when I save an update, it'll strip those out, uh, update the nine box return. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, generate that reconciliation report for us so we can go back to the ERP system later on and strip out those duplicate transactions that were removed here. Now, the same thing goes for our final standard check, which is looking at um, any transactions with what we call an unexpected VAT rate, which just means that they're half a percentage point outside of our standard 25 or 0%. Now, finally, on top of that, we've got our, we've got the ability to create your own custom checks. So often as part of the implementation, when we're talking to a client, we'll ask them, uh, what sort of checks are you doing? Uh, what checks would you like to be replicated within the software so that you don't have to manually build those yourself anymore? Uh, and often they can think, be things from, spanning from sort of tax code reviews. You see here we've got some automated blocking of business entertainment, and it's really variable and it's entirely bespoke to you. It's a really great way to build out those checks and have a really robust system of review uh, without you having to sort of manually scroll through Excel and look at those transactions on a line by line basis. So once we're happy with that, the next section that we can think about doing before submission is posting our manual adjustments. Uh, so manual adjustments are really straightforward. Um, I, I saw a couple of questions in the um, Q&A box, so hopefully this will clear up some of those. But essentially, any adjustment that isn't calculated um, within your ERP system needs to be posted as a manual adjustment. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, fully digitally linked. It just needs to be linked into the process. So if you're doing it with an Excel, having it as an, in a separate sheet and, link, sheet and linking it through into the rest of your Excel process is fine. In this example, though, what we're doing is we're actually taking um, the Excel or the information where uh, the adjustment was calculated and uploading it directly to the software. So you can see here, if I want to post an adjustment, I'm going to give it an amount, a description. And then finally, what I'm going to do is upload the supporting documentation. And it's within here that I can then drop an Excel file that contains the calculation, any backing data, any information around it. And so that when I post the adjustment, not only am I posting that correct amount to the correct boxes, but I'm giving evidence as to why it couldn't have been digitally linked in my process and how I got to that eventual adjustment, just so that if HMRC do ever do a VAT inspection or a VAT audit, I've got all the information there that they need. Now, finally, before we look at that nine box, nine box reporting, um, we can have a look at the reconciliation reports as well. And as I said, these are just to make sure that your everything that you change with an alphabet can be tied back to your accounting packages. Uh, and so you can see the first example we've got down here is our duplicate transactions. So this is looking at um, the duplicate transactions that we stripped out, giving you those in them, giving them to you in their full detail so that you can account it elsewhere. And the same goes for our edited transactions as well. You can see a nice clear breakdown of the original transaction we edited, the data point that we edited highlighted, and then on the right hand side, the audit trail of who made the change, when and why. So once we're happy with that, the last thing to look at before submitting is the reporting itself on digital links. So not only are we capturing transactions that aren't hitting these nine boxes, such as these excluded inputs that we uh, blocked earlier on, uh, but also from the nine boxes themselves, we can drill down from any of these figures to the underlying transactions. So if I select my box four, I can see all of the separate inputs into it. I can see my purchases, my blocked inputs, my adjustments. And then to see these in any more detail, I can select the figure again, and it'll take me down to the line by line report of the transactions contained within that box. So now within my purchases, I can see a nice clear breakdown of all the transactions in there. I can see any audit trail on the right hand side, 
and I can feel comfortable that I've got my full digital link in place. Now, once we're happy with that, what we can do is come back to the nine box summary and get ready to submit the return. Now, this works both for uh, single filers and groups. The process is very similar, but rather than um, having to uh, worry about um, sort of um, just submitting the single file um, for uh, a group summary, what we're going to do is instead mark each individual group member as sort of ready for consolidation. And when it comes to the final submission, you can just submit the entire group return in one go. Uh, now, what you can see there, they've just submitted the single file off to HMRC. Uh, once it's submitted, I get the standard receipt, all that sort of information. Uh, and of course, I can always go back and view the return to look at any of those adjustments, to look at anything in that level of detail. Now, across the top here, we've got four additional tabs, which are just aimed to bring a little bit more value to the process. And if anything, make it a little bit more holistic, reduce those key person dependencies. And the first one is our documents tab. Now documents, what it's doing is it's tracking um, and it's containing any files uploaded as part of those manual adjustments. But also what you can do here is just upload anything that's relevant for the VAT return that you think would be useful. So that could be process guidance, what to, what to export from the ERP, if you've got internal controls and checks that need to be monitored and completed, you can save all of those here. Uh, on top of that, we've got our entity summary. This is where we've got some high level information about the entity, the RN numbers, that sort of information. But on the right hand side, it's also where we're creating those data cleansing checks. So you can see our three standard checks. And on top of that, you can see those custom checks that's been built. And this is where you can come in and build your own uh, custom checks on an ad hoc basis as well. Next, the payments liabilities screen. What this is doing is it's tracking um, your current position with HMRC. Um, so whether you've got any sort of liabilities or outstanding amounts, any payments you've made, and also the date due and the date paid. And this doesn't require any upkeep from yourselves. It's all directly from HMRC's portal. It just means you have access to this information without having to log into HMRC's portal every time. Now, finally, um, we've got our analytics screen. And now the analytics screen, it becomes really useful when you've uploaded more than a few quarters worth of data, because what it's doing is providing you a comparable view across returns. And you can see in this example here, I've got six different quarters of data uploaded on the right hand, on the left hand side. And now by selecting the analytics tab, I can go into this nice report that's showing me um, some really clear breakdowns. Um, so first of all, I can select the period that I'm interested in. I can select the comparison period, uh, or whether that's the previous period of the year before. And then within this first report, I can see a really nice breakdown of the movement of those nine boxes. So I can see both the percentage and the value change, and it's really helpful for monitoring just targets or um, sort of budget, or also looking at things like seasonal business or periods exceptional expenditure. And um, we've also got a breakdown of the net back to pay to HMRC, uh, again, with that same comparison period. And then finally, at the bottom here, we've got two additional reports, one on the total VAT payable for the period, again, for the year projection, and then on our left hand side, we've got our data summary, which is a bit more granular. And instead, here we're going through sort of our total transactions, anything that's been blocked, excluded or removed, and then our manual adjustments as well, just so that you have a good idea of what those look like between the two periods. And of course, we're still maintaining that digital link. So if you want to look at any of these in more detail, for example, if I want to investigate my block transactions for this period, I can select this box. It'll take me through to the summary of both those amounts. Then I select it once more. Uh, and you'll see it'll take me down to that line by line report again. So not only are we making sure that that digital link is always present, but you've always got access to it and you've always got that proof that you yourself can go in and see it. Um, but yeah, so hopefully uh, that's helpful. It's a quick sort of insight into how we're helping uh, to sort of help our clients get their process digitally linked in a way that not only drives efficiency and accuracy, uh, but also means that a lot of the preparation is automated for them so they can spend a lot more time on those value added opportunities. Um, so brilliant, I think back to you, Carl, to get those uh, slides back up. Sorry, just unmuting myself there. So in terms of the slides, let me open up now. I press the right button. Hopefully you can all see my screen again now. So really, yeah, really just to finish off, just before we get onto the, the questions, just really five key things we recommend looking 
at and, and assessing when you go through any of your technology or, or process reviews. First of all, just critically assess what, what you want to do. Where are the weakest links within your process? Are you taking a sticky plaster approach right now? Are you looking at your process longer term to really know what you want to get out of the review? Secondly, form a strategy. Um, we appreciate a lot of businesses we work with don't necessarily adopt technology on a regular basis. It's really important from the outset to get senior buy-in around the business, whether that's with your management team, whether that's with your IT team, get wider buy-in from the business. We see a lot, much more success with, with projects and processes when that's done. Assess the market. Technology is genuinely moving as quick as I've ever seen it in my career. There's a lot of change at the moment going on. There are a lot of solutions out there in the market. Do look at the market to make sure the providers you're, you're speaking with and looking, looking at are most suitable in terms of what you're looking to do. Pick, the, pick vendors. I think historically, different packages didn't necessarily work very well together. And now, now technology packages do tend to integrate fairly well. So it's an opportunity to invest and implement technology best in class. Just make sure any technology you are investing in does play nicely with any of your existing systems, especially your ERP system. And finally, Look at how you can add value to your process. Look at how you can get data, insights from your data. You really should be looking solely on, on compliance. Yes, it may be a reason to change right now, but do look at the wider value you're getting from that process change. Is it making your lives easier? Is it improving the value you're providing back to the business? You want to make sure where you're making any type of investment that you're able to provide value to your team and to the business. So that's everything I really wanted to cover today. That moves us on finally to answer any questions that you may have.